Welcome to the number one show in the world named the official Beats Coin Podcast. We are on episode 10 now. That's got to be a milestone, right? There's so much to talk about, and I'll try to make it quick because our interview with Brian carried a little longer than I thought, and it was really, really good, so I want you guys to listen to everything. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to my guy, Johnny. Uh, on Twitter, he's at Joliwa, J-O-L-I-W-A. He did our uh, animations on our website. If you go to beatscoin.io, you'll be able to see his uh, awesome animations, and he does that for many projects. So if you're interested, whether you know, you're know you a Tron project or some sort of crypto project and you want some animations, or you know you just want a cool avatar of yourself, he's the guy to talk to. Go find him. I also want to give a shout out to Tron Europe. We had our little Twitter contest, and they gave us a run for our money, but you know what? I'm sorry, Tron Europe. We love you. We support you, but you ain't going to beat the Beatscoin community. Anyways, let's talk about our Super Rep campaign. First off, thank you everyone for your votes of TRX. Uh, thanks to David and Misha over at I Am Decentralized for giving us a huge shout out. In a few days, we were able to reach up to 50 million TRX, which is one third of the way that we needed to go. Now, We've run into some technical difficulties and we wanted to just get this a million percent sorted out before reaching the top 27. So we're kind of pausing our push. You can still vote for us, but we're pausing our push to get there. So we're not going to market it as hard. We don't want anyone upset because they didn't get their rewards for the day. You know, nevertheless, we still want to encourage voting for us because we will be putting every single TRX that we earn straight into the project promise you that. All right, let's get to the interview now. I spoke to Brian Genois, aka Genius, because that's how his name sounds when you spell it. He is a professional guitarist. We had a great conversation about music, about Tron, and I promise you, you're going to want to listen because there are so many great nuggets of information that he gives. So let's get to it. So Brian, you have been a in the professional music field for, uh, or, or you were in it for a while, and you know a lot about the industry, and boy, we talked for quite a few hours uh, the last couple of weeks, so I'm glad you are here and we can talk a little bit, but um, let's start with, uh, start with your, your childhood and how you kind of got into music. Oh, wow. Yeah. So actually a very good friend of the family, and may he rest in peace, um, Dennis Polk, uh, handed me a pair of kungas and this Tesco Tesco guitar. And I think it had five strings. (laughs) A Tesco guitar? I've never heard of that. Yeah, a Tesco. I think it was called that's the brand. T-E-S-C-O. Yeah, it's it's kind of like back in the you know, gosh, it was it came out of the seventies, okay? okay, and it probably made somewhere in Japan or Korea, but right. it was probably a copy of a Fender Telecaster, and uh, mm-hmm. I guess I'll send you a copy of that one of these days. But that was you know that's how I guess I started playing guitar. Actually, um, I, I kind of I, I popped the skins on the kungas. <laughs> and, you know, I, I ended Let up, me move you know, you the had, guitar now. yeah, the guitar, right. So, you know, after that, I didn't have anything to play. Um, and shucks, uh, I had five strings on the guitar and 
and that around that time, I don't, you know, know how much you follow, you know, the music of the seventies, but I mean, you, you just had so many groups, you know, my ears were all over the place coming out of the six, the seventies and, you know, listening to Motown and, and eventually, you know, I ended up, um, just playing by ear for a long time and towards high school and started playing, um, actually, uh, Fishbone, um, the group called Fishbone, actually, um, Kendall went to high school with me and he was playing guitar and we did talent shows together and, uh, yeah, Fishbone. That must have been a great experience. Yeah, the Fishbone and Red Hot Chili Peppers were out. Of, you know, were starting out big back then. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, you grew up so in Los Angeles, right? That's right, City of Angels, as they say, <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> and I know you have a lot of friends in the industry, uh, but you you have some family in the music industry as well. Um. Yes, actually. Um, Quite a bit. Um, my well, the entertainment side on the on the broadcast side. My first cousin was the radio broadcast. I, I, I guess I don't know who the popular DJs are in your town, but Alvin John Waples. Uh, he just passed away too, but uh, he was like Michael Jackson's. Um, main front man and when it came to like radio television he would broadcast and and do all the shows for michael live and tv and uh even bring us out to the jackson's homes you know when we were younger because uh, michael yeah. and the, they you couldn't come out yeah I, <laughs> yeah. I could, yeah I can only imagine man it's, if he goes out uh i was watching Chris Tucker was good friends with Michael Jackson, and he was, uh, I think, in a comedy special, just kind of talking about some experiences he had with him. Um, what do you remember about him? Because I remember you told me that um, y- you were smaller, of course, but mm-hmm. your your cousins and stuff would hang out with him or were friends with him, right? Right. No, what it is is my sisters, right? Oh, your so sisters. Okay. My, my first cousin, Alvin John Waples, he, he was like the, this big DJ. Uh, and KGFJ in out of Los Angeles, um, and um, you know, and then you had 1580K Day, which was uh, Stevie Wonder uh, was a part of that. So Alvin was big, you know, he was all over the radio. So, but for whatever, I, I think what it was is, um, as you know, Michael's mom is a uh, Jehovah Witness, and and my my first cousin Alvin. Um, he was a Jehovah Witness, and like I said, he passed away. But because of that. Um, I, they all went to the same Kingdom Hall, so that's how the relationship between Michael and Alvin and the, and the Jacksons, you know, commenced. And so I just vividly remember, like, my sisters, every, like, weekend they would go out to, like, Simi Valley and go out to the um, Jacksons, and the whole Motown would be there, and they would come back and have all these pictures, you know? <laughs> wow. And, I was always playing football, so, you know, honestly, I didn't get a chance to really hang out, but I would always show these pictures to friends and, you know, they'd be like, oh, you kind of show off about it, (laughs) even though you weren't necessarily there. (laughs) I was excited, man, you know, and, um, and this was way before Chris Tucker. I mean, this was Michael. He was, you know, he was like a teenager, teenager. So that's how, you know, I grew up around the entertainment business. So for me, it was just, it felt natural. So, you know, I'm not, uh, what do you call starstruck because I just grew up around a lot of musicians um, from even um, Tina Turner. I mean, I met her, uh, her, all of her sons and her sons very well. Um, um, in fact, they, they helped me to learn guitar. They would teach me parts, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie wow. Turner. Yeah. He, he played bass. He would show me licks and I met their father, uh, Ike Turner senior, you know, he had a studio in uh, La Cienega. Um, and Ike Turner Jr. and Michael, they all, they're just all, they're all talented, you know, and they just, and they're friends, you know, so <laughs> I was around music all the time. It just, it was meant for, to be, you know, to be honest with you. Who would you say is like your most um, kind of influential musician and tell me like your greatest experience with them? Okay, that that's a remember. very good Oh no, I can't. I can't. Um, the thing is, there. You know, it's this is very 
may be hard to kind of, kind of grasp, but I, I was influenced by so much music. I, it was like just like a, ch- a kid in a candy store not knowing how to focus. But I would say the one person that really influenced me the most was a, a, another musician who passed away. <laughs> His name is Gary Scheider, or they call him Diaper Man. And if you ever get a chance, Diaper you should. You sh- <laughs> yes. The reason being is because there's a group called Parliament Funkadelics. Yes. yes. G- George Clinton. Okay. And I hung in the studios with those guys i played with bootsy collins uh in the studio you know uh, they would let me come hang out through my sister and they would mentor me you know so i sliced stone um but i would say gary scheider because gary scheider who they call diaper man okay <laughs> but gary okay, yeah, scheider so, so why why did why exactly did they call him he didn't like poop his pants or something <laughs> well well that's a very good well okay really his name is star his name is really star child but uh-huh. diaper man. That's, a, that's he, a better name, Star Child. No, but he wore a diaper, right? That's what it was. He wore, he always came out on stage with a diaper. And oh, if you ever, a, okay, yeah. But you know, the whole thing with Parliament Funkadelic, it was a movement. They had these characters, right? Okay, uh, they had these characters, right? And so, uh, it's so no, it's entertainment on top of music, right? Big time, big time. Kind of like what Earth, Wind, and Fire used to do. So. And they, these guys are still funking too, right? I mean, you know, the, the grandchildren are playing now, and George is getting ready to retire. But it was Gary Scheider, man. Um, you got to understand. I, can you imagine having, and I'm, this is literally speaking, 20 musicians. I mean, I'm talking about the best musicians, okay? Hand-picked musicians, the best out there. Mm-hmm. But you would have like five or six guitar players. And typically when you have too many musicians, you have a clash. But no. George Clinton was a musical conductor. You can picture a a traffic cop in the busiest peak time of rush hour conducting traffic. This was George Clinton and all those guitar players. But it was something about Gary Scheider, the way he would command the crowd, the tension. He knew how to, and him and George were Batman and Robin on stage. But it was Gary Scheider because he would, he would sit me down and, you know, and, play in the stu- tell me to play you know play these parts and of course i'm nervous you know it's like don't worry about it if you make a mistake never stop hmm. never stop so i learned a lot about recording in the studio some of them is best some of your mistakes can turn out to be your best stuff you know you may have heard that before just play don't don't worry about it it was gary scheider though just um he influenced me to this day man and awesome. and so many so many musicians though i mean like I just mentioned him because, you know, it, it, for obvious reasons, this guy was amazing, the whole group. Yeah, they were huge in the 70s, right? Am I, yeah, 70s well. And, they, and a little bit of the 80s as well, right? Yeah, the thing is, is the, exactly. 70s, they, they, the movement was peaking. You know, you had you, they would have the funk festival and, uh, and, uh, and then the 80s, right? The 80s was like Atomic Dog came out of the 80s. And then... What happened was, as the R&B and funk scene started to kind of uh, slow down, you know, as rap started to pick up, right? Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. the interesting thing is, the rappers, when they were sampling, who, where were they getting those samples? Primarily from James Brown and George Clinton, part of my Funkadelics, from Snoop Dogg to, to Ice-T, the Ice Cube, all, everybody to this day. You cannot be in the rap game and not ever say, you know, that you didn't bite off of George Clinton. You know, so what happened was the rappers kind of resurrected um, George. And to this day, man, you know, like Parliament Funk Delicate, they're still playing, still playing. Wow. So what would you say are your, uh, for you personally, when it comes to performing, what's your genres that kind of get you going the most or that you enjoy the most? Um, I would have to say it's funk um, because I, 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 you know, naturally grew up playing funk, hanging around George. Um, so funk, but then uh, obviously R and B, because you know, grow, growing up in South Central Los Angeles, I heard you know Motown to all the music in the '70s. And interesting thing about um, the '70s, those bands, like when you heard a band in the '70s. Um, it was unique. It was like each band had their own fingerprint. 
So, you you know, it wasn't like the same sound. It was very distinctive. Right. So uh, a lot of R&B, uh, I tend to, you know, and jazz and blues. Um, but be- because of the P-Funk in Parliament, they would rock out. So um, <laughs> whatever whatever the mood is, man, you know, th- that's a good question. I gravitate quite naturally towards funk and R&B. But oh, in, the, in the latter years, I started you know, producing music and, and making tracks. And, you know, you put on the hat and you just, um, depending on what you're going after, you know, you, your vibe, you know, if, if it's a jazz right. field, then it's jazz field, right? Yeah, so when we talked last time, you were telling me that you did uh, spend some time performing, right, and with some bands? Yes. Tell yeah, I did. about those experiences. How was, how was that? Oh, wow. I mean, you know, you, if you've ever played sports before, you know how the, the feeling that you get, like, okay, uh, well, well, some people shy away, but when, you know, when the spotlights turn on, it's like, I would get energetic, you know? I mean, just the, the energy playing in front of uh, people did something different, you know, for me. I, I enjoyed that, you know, the interaction. So I, start, I, I grew up playing with this, uh, this neighborhood group called Star Attraction. We were called Star Attraction because, you know, in the 80s, it was you know <laughs> groups were a little bit more flashy <laughs> back then you know so we we were called star attraction you have to show me a picture i will show you a picture and you're gonna laugh mm-hmm. right and the thing is is this there was this there was no symmetry meaning i mean well kind of like the jacksons you had tito the tallest you know jermaine it was like from small to <laughs> tall from four to you know six foot tall it wasn't so, no uh, Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. Huh? No, man, no, it wasn't in sync. So I was, I was the youngest. I was like seventeen. I was like seventeen, and you know, playing with guys that were already close to thirties. You know, um, they wanted me in the band, so I started there, and then I started playing with um, more. I, you know, I kind of got introduced to some groups that were actually starting to make names for themselves you know guys that have been with motown like for example if you, you i'm sure you heard of animal house you know john belushi yeah, and the whole thing and and i'm sure you the song the song shout you know uh the, if you ever listen to that it's a very popular song even the, the isley brothers but anyways lloyd williams um the original singer the guy who sung that song shout was passing through the neighborhood uh, and he, you know, he's played with Motown <laughs> and he heard me like doing solos on the guitar. I think it was playing a solo to Knee Deep, which was Parliament again, Funkadelics. And he knocked on my door and was like, hey, wow, you sound really good. Are you playing with anyone? I was like, no, not right now. Just kind of got out of the group. He was like, well, we need to put a band together. I want you to be my guitar player. So Lloyd no Williams. Way. He he just you know, ha- he just passed by and he heard you. He was working in a, in a factory that was... Um, down about a block and a half so we'd always pass through the street you know and of course i would just you know Did we jam in the garage or what no man no i had a we had the stereo i had i had the 12 inch of uh not just needy you know back then okay okay, so you, you're, okay uh-huh. that was the first time any song would play for 12 you know it was like 12 minutes okay the average song length is like uh three minutes this thing went like for 12 or 15 minutes i forgot it was it's called the long version so i was doing solos michael hampton solo was crazy so i was just practicing that and all of a sudden i heard just bam 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 i thought it was a neighbor getting ready to tell me (laughs) you know because you know you know how that gets but no it was lloyd and he was like yeah i'm a singer and i was like okay well what are you saying well right now i'm i'm not but you know i was with a group called undisputed truth um Joe Harris, Joe Pep Harris, too, uh, another guy who did a lot of uh, sessions with. Now, Joe Pep Harris um, had a great, still today, there's a song called Smiling Faces. You should look it up. Uh, again, that was another group called Undisputed Truth, Smiling Faces by Smiling Holland Faces Dozier Hajo. Yeah, you know, Smiling Faces Sometimes Don't Lie, you know. So you get a chance to Google that. It's a, it's a very classic song. And uh, Holland Dozier Hauser, uh, Holland Dozier Hauser, I think is the name. But they uh, they're out of Motown. Those, those guys are no longer around. But they were big producers in Motown. And wrote a lot of those hits. So, 
my question to you is obviously you were really talented and people wanted to have you in their bands and I mean I know you still continue to do music but what kept you from you know going all out into seeking um I don't want to say the word fame but like a 100% living out of it well that's a very good question because again growing up in Los Angeles I mean that's kind of like you know, the place to be, Hollywood, you know, I was there already. And to be honest with you, I, I really did want to be a rock star, you know, ironically. But, um, well, I was seven, you know, I was 17 and I just felt, um, I think at that time, I, my guitar skills, you know, it was good enough to be in, uh, to play with these groups. But most of these guys were older than I was, you know, so I'm 17. These guys are like already like close to 30, 25, 26, right. you know, it, getting into clubs. I felt kind of always kind of like out of place. Right. So um, for me, growing up, you know, coming out of a foundation of just had I started studying the Bible and just having a conscious, you know, I, at some point. I felt like, okay, I was over my head, <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. 17, 18, I can't get to the bars, you know, but at some point I wanted to be balanced and I kind of got a bad taste in my mouth for um, things that were happening to me in the industry, to be honest, to be quite honest with you. I just felt like, oh, this environment just doesn't feel good. And uh, this is it's not what it, it's not what I thought it was. It's, you know, taking your travel grabbing your having to take your equipment and drag it around and and to you know guys not paying you when they should um and then just seeing things i'm like ah this is not for me you know um at some point i i felt like the business kind of um turned me off the business side of it right and that was yeah i'm sorry go ahead no i was just saying and that was you know i'm giving you that perspective from like the the late 80s to 90s you know it was very overwhelming to me right I, I think like people only see the glorious side of the fame and being a rock star and the whole hollywood thing but there's a lot of shadiness that goes down um you know in, in business and in other facets that you know kind of is, is a huge turnoff. So I, I could see why you definitely kind of be detracted from that and kind of move on. Um, my favorite song actually is called uh, Several Ways to Die Trying. It's by a band called Dashboard Confessional. And pretty much in that song, he talks about um, California, about Los Angeles, how it's a place that people go to for these, you know, huge dreams but in reality, it's not all that it's cracked up to be, you know? Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so I I saw stuff that I didn't want a part of, you know, and I had a conscious, you know, I had a, a spiritual conscious. So when I started seeing certain things, I mean, to be honest with you, I won't get into those details, but mm -hmm. I was awakening to the point where uh, where my equipment was in the studio. It was a it was a studio where Shaka Khan actually um, used to uh, record out of, and I just left my equipment. I didn't want to come back. You know, they, folks were asking me why. I'm like, uh, you know, I I, I I was the type of person back then. I would just jet out <laughs> if I didn't like something, so I left my equipment. <laughs> but I want to go back to something because um, I don't like to mess anyone's name up. I had yeah, kind of yeah. got a dry mouth. I had mentioned Motown songwriter, but um, I did say Holland Dozier, but it's Holland Dozier Holland. So if you mm. ever get a chance, you look him up. He um, wrote a lot of hits for Holland Motown. Dozier, yes. He produced Undisputed Truth, Joe Pep Harris, who, who did Smiling Faces, and then Lloyd Williams, who uh, sung Shout. These were guys that influenced me as well. Something, Good friends of mine. Something that's really cool about... Um your perspective which is also very unique is that you've kind of lived in my opinion and tell me if i'm wrong through kind of three phases of music and in its industry um yes what what can you tell me about and and this will kind of start leading our conversation into uh crypto because i know a lot, a lot of people yep. want to hear about that so uh tell me about okay music in the 80s and 90s the industry we know it's one right. way 
Then mm-hmm. kind of uh, late 90s, early 2000s, up to maybe like 2010, it was another way. Then mm-hmm. kind of past 2010 to now, it is completely different. Um, right. <laughs> tell me, you know, how the industry looked like then and then right. kind of how we got to where we are, in your opinion, and, you know, what you think we can expect in, you know, the coming years. Okay. Very good question, by the way. So I'm going to tell you from the time that I first, you know, walked into a studio and started recording <laughs> in the studio. It was all about one take you know, like your skill level needed to be at a certain level where you didn't waste people's money and time. And what I mean by that is if you take an eraser, um, take an an eraser, pencil eraser, and let's say you're writing um, a a paragraph and you didn't like it. Now you would erase that, right? Right. After a couple of times, you know, what's going to happen to that paper, correct? (laughs) You know, what's going to happen. Yeah. It's not going to look as good. You could tell that it's been erased. well, not only that, the paper's going to thin, it's going to wear out, okay? And it's going to just, it's going to probably tear. So what would happen right. is in the studios, they had these um, reel-to-reel. It, this was the, before digital. It was really um, a reel-to-reel. It was tape, okay? And so every time you made a mistake, if you made a mistake, of course the engineer and producers would get very pissed because they would have to roll back and start over. And every time you do that, you're racing. So you would thin, you would degrade the tape. So musicians back then had to really, really, really be good. And so what what I would say, the difference there was most of your time was spent perfecting your craft. You didn't really step out unless you really had a skill where you could play live and do one and not make mistakes. And if you did make, make mistakes, you were good enough where no one really knew it. But in the studios, they needed you to preserve that tape. So that's what I remember out of the, I'm going to say the 80s. Um, I'm going to say the 80s. And then at some point, you started getting the, the era of digital recording where mm-hmm. they had ADATs. And so then, you know, now you could, now you could edit, you know. So it wasn't about you got to get it right in one shot. You know, if you did make a mistake, it wasn't because you were degrading the tape per se. It was more about you're wasting time and we got to get going, you know. But uh, and also it was a time where record companies would give you, you know, a a set budget. They would give you, you know, let's say an advancement. And that money was was supposed to be used for recording. So let's say it was one hundred thousand dollars. Right. And you, you were a band. Well, you would use that to record your album. Give just for example. All right. Now, at some point when digital recording consoles came into play and and leading, I'm going to say, to the to the 90s where musicians were starting to become smart. Okay, meaning they would still get these advancements, but they would start recording at home. (laughs) They would actually start getting (laughs) buying because they could afford the equipment. Right. They didn't have to go to this major recording studio. They would get these budgets and they would pocket some of that money and and obviously do their do their uh, albums and their records and their singles then the record labels kind of caught up to that and say hey hey you know we're not going to give you this um, this much money any longer all right we're going to give you this amount because we know you can get the the, the album done cheaper so that that's kind of what i remember you know was uh, as you started leading towards the the nineties, um, it was becoming digital and, you know, you had more flexibility. Um, and of course at that time, bands started dis- disappearing. <laughs> it was guys with turntables, you know, that started popping up <laughs> right, right about the nineties, you know, so the bands, you know, you couldn't really find, couldn't find gigs. Guitar- yeah. You know, so rap, you know, kind of popped up in, in the nineties and then it became really interesting at that point, And, uh, not to drift, but I would say analog, obviously, 70s, 80s, and then around 90s, it was digital. And then in the 2000s, uh, you know, it was more about Pro Tools and everybody was, you know, everybody has a DAW, digital audio workstation in their home. Mm-hmm. And around that time, it was more about you had to really perform to make your living because 
of course, we know Napster, right? Napster kind of yeah. um, hurt the musicians, hurt the industry. And so it was a drastic change where you can no longer make a record, get paid royalties. Because back in the 80s, you, and another thing I want to tell you, but in the 80s, you could make, you could do a hit record and really didn't have to go out and perform much. You made a lot of money off of royalties. But in the 90s, it was starting to turn where you had to get out there and because because of what was happening with the downloading and you, you know you had to perform and in the 2000s i mean you know all these companies uh, record labels were uh, absorbing acquiring each other and um, it was harder to break through so you know now uh <laughs> well now I, I i felt i feel that you know i saw a change from the west coast it was it was the east coast when you know when i started listening to rap, it was like, okay, the East Coast was very hot. I was still in Los Angeles. And then it's shift to the West Coast, right? So I grew up right near Crenshaw Boulevard, where the movie White Man Can't Jump, you know, all the, all, all wow. that stuff Ice, Ice Cube did is right on Crenshaw Boulevard. I grew up right around there near USC. So that was, that was an interesting time because, you know, it was gangster rap. So all the stuff that was going on, I, I saw it all, okay? <laughs> so all of that stuff. You know, to <laughs> and then, yeah, no, I saw it. I mean, you know, and I was around it. Okay, and so then it shifted. It went from East Coast to West Coast, and then it started going to Midwest. So in '96, I moved from um, from California to to New York, and um, and then I started seeing, you know, the industry change again, where it was like. Wow, you very very hard to make it, guys. You know, it was you, you really. It's almost like, you know, you couldn't get in unless you were liked or you had to <laughs> um, kiss a lot of behind <laughs> to, to, to make it. You know, it was just it was just very difficult. And um, I know many, many, many echo that same sentiment. Yes. And, and I want to go back to what you said. And I was going to ask and you pretty much answered the question. Like, it does seem like back in the 80s, they would spend more time making music and less time having to tour and everything. And now you're seeing the opposite. Like these musicians are maybe making one album in a year. And then after that, they're touring like eight months, six to eight months out of the year. It's crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, um, I remember when MTV first started, you know, um, that was the, around the time. Again, you know, you could do a video and that was it. You didn't, you know, you didn't have to tour. And a lot of that changed primarily because um, when Napster started, you know, figure, figuring out a way to help people who couldn't afford to, you know, buy this, you know, these expensive albums, you know, and you would get sometimes maybe two or three songs off, I guess, an album. But Napster, you know, figured out a way how to allow you to download it. And it wasn't legal. You know, but it started this trend and it was a war against techs and gurus who really, you know, despised the music industry, to be honest with you. They were pissed off at, you know, feeling like they were just there was too much greed out there, you know, overcharging. Still so is. <laughs> still is. And, and so that changed thing, it. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say the crazy thing now is, you know, that there's a complete shift now to where you could say a lot of casual listeners, they're happy. And the industry itself, the labels and stuff, the especially the big ones, they're still making their money. But now the artists are left. They're the ones that get screwed over now. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's at a point right now. Um, it, well, the industry, the music, the entertainment industry got really hurt, too, because as artists, music began to be become free because of the downloading um, they couldn't really make a living like that. And the, obviously the labels were losing money too. So you started seeing record labels going under, acquisitions, you know, now you got like one or two, okay? But back in the day, I mean, you had like dozens. You had all these record labels, right? And now they just dissipated. And it all, again, it's because the times changed. Music was being, you know, stolen practically because of the downloads that's that's stealing music you're not paying for it 
So record labels got hurt, you know, and the artists got hurt. Now, it's at a point now, and even this deal, you hear a lot of musicians saying, you know, they don't like it, but there's something called a 360, and right, all that is, everybody's, everybody's sharing, you know, everybody's partners, okay? It's kind of like having a restaurant, and the mentality is, instead of just having a worker come in, worrying about that worker, maybe it's just, you know, when they get a chance stealing money out of the cash register, you make them a part of your business so they can see, feel like they're valued. So everybody now has got a part of this thing. It's a 360 deal, but still you'll hear musicians say it's, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. So um, I think it's, it's worse for, for the artists because now not only are they not making their monies, but they have the tour and still, you know, it's hard to make it, you know, unless you are and a I select many, few. Right. And many artists, they've conditioned themselves and it's, it almost feels like they're at the point of no return where they can't do anything about it. And this is kind of where blockchain comes in to be able to right. kind of change the world of music. But where do you see the happy medium? Because obviously, you know, it's not fair for you and I and a listener to, you know, pay an outrageous amount. But at the same time, we have to respect our artist and, you know, if we're fans or we we appreciate their music, they, they need to make their money, you know? And for a, for that profession, they deserve to make, you know, a, gr- a great living from it. At least a living from it, because a lot of them, they can't make a living out of it. Just no, that's so true. No, that's so true. Well, um, I think if you really think about this... Um, I th- it's a it's a it's a it's a mindset in terms of people. You know, like we feel like we have. Sometimes we feel like, oh, we we see something we can get for free, we take it. But I believe now, like if I hear something, man, I download it. You know, I I think people are willing to pay for music. I I don't think that's an issue because you can get a song and get you may just like one song. You don't have to buy an entire album. So. Having a change in format where you don't have to buy an album for $15, $20, not everybody can afford that. But to pay $0.99, cents, it's very easy to do these days. So right. I think with, with uh, mediums like Apple and other streaming companies, they played a vital role because they, they recondition and program the minds of people that it's okay to pay for things. You know, If you value something, pay for it. Now, with that said, you still have to look at greedy the greedy middleman you know like obviously artists have been dealing with the abuse through their record labels just being tied to these bad contracts and really doing all the great work and not getting paid right you know a lot of it you can say well you have to educate yourself you know you have to take the time and know the music business is true but then again you you know you kind of want you expect people to do the right thing and maybe mentor you you want, and to the, you want to be able to trust your record label. You, know? you want to be able to trust your record label, but there's no such thing as that. You know, it's it's re- it really isn't. It's a, so so now we get into this digital era where it's no longer you know a brick and mortar. It's like you have these organic companies that are doing the same thing all over again. There's just they're just streaming streaming it, but now they're not paying still the musicians the, the right way. And I, I remember reading an article where. It was like Lady Gaga. It was like, you know, she sold some ridiculous units. And it was something like she got paid $1,500 or something. Wow. I'm going to try to find that article. And I, I scratched my head and I said, wow. Just like well, you. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. Well, I do know that an average of what you make per 100,000 100, streams on Spotify is about $700. But that's, right. That's before giving your portion to the label, the band members, the writers, exactly. et cetera, what, you know, whoever you may owe for that. So who knows how much they really take home, right? Very little. Very little. And so, I mean, I think um, heading you know, to the subject of blockchain, it's a great thing when you can remove obstacles out of the way and not have these barriers unnecessarily in the middle because everybody wants to ride the wave you know people they see something great everybody wants to jump on it you know and that's kind of like the world we live in unfortunately but when it comes to musicians and artists and bands you know i think they've we have been struggling so long 
having to have all this overhead and getting the short end of the stick all the time to have a new technology that can pretty much allow transparency um, that can remove unnecessary overhead, for example, um, without going into all the details of how blockchain work, but the fact that you can have a an immutable ledger that can never be, data can never be removed out of that, okay, without every other computer node knowing about it. Um, that means that I could put a song on the blockchain, and that's my copyright. There's no more dispute at that point. Yep. That's my copyright. And also, it's my distrib distribution. And it's also my publishing, in the sense, because my publishing company, well, they pay me money. They advance me money. But I have to share 50% of my royalties with them because they are tracking everything that goes on. When music is in the elevator or in the, in the supermarket, well, of all those fees that businesses have to pay, that goes back to the artists. So what I see moving forward is the artists taking con complete control of everything that they do, rightfully so, and not unless they choose to partner, they don't have to. Your copyright is, right. and you know, and, and who knows what, what Library of Congress, what role they really want to play, but the point is, you know, back in the day when there was a, a record store like Tower Records, you know, there was such things called CDs that used to be in the store. But not all the CDs, <laughs> yeah. and but not all the CDs made it there. They fell off the truck. With blockchain, there's no such thing. You account for every single transaction, and if someone wants your music through smart contracts, you know what? You can have it. Send me, send me a digital payment of that. Send me a digital, you know, token. Send, send me a coin that's worth that has value. Um, and you automatically can stream that. And by the way, good luck trying to copy it and and you know and sell it and bootleg it. You can't because with blockchain, it prevents someone from duplicating your original content trying to copy it. So it's you know I I wish there were so many artists who never had the opportunity to live in this air, you know. But it's going to change everything for the artists. And at some point. It will. There will be no more excuses. And what I mean by that is, if your music is good, because like they said, there, there's an ear for. Everybody has a different ear. You, I may play a song you may not like. You may not like it, but somebody else may like it, right? But the bottom line is, if you can reach out and and you can remove those barriers, now it's just up to you. You know, as as good as you are musically, and you can reach. You know, the mass people hear that. You don't need someone telling you that your music is not good enough to be. To be played, <laughs> um, yeah. you have a and, free. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and not only that, but you can charge for your music. <laughs> you well, don't exactly. have to give it for free, and that's what I realize that a lot of artists they have to put all their stuff up for free and just kind of pray that they'll get noticed. And it's it's a shame that they've been conditioned to this. I mean, it, it may be no fault of their own. It's just kind of the way that things have shifted. But once they realize and know their worth, people are willing to support. And if they realize that they have to buy it now, you know, I still feel like there's a place for streaming and we'll have that available, at least with what we're doing in Beats Coin. But I think that artists should work a lot more towards, you know, realizing the importance of, you know, selling their stuff instead of, you know, just being satisfied, putting it all out there for free, you know? And I agree with you. And I think that uh, you'll see that in, in going back to Apple uh, and um, I say Apple, but, you know, not to no pun intended. There's a lot of streaming companies, but I use Google and uh, Apple a lot, Google Music. And if I hear something, you know, I'll do a like and then I'll just pay for it. See, I, I just, like I said, I think um, this just could be me, okay? But I really feel that there's been a paradigm shift where we went from like trying to grab as much free stuff as we could, not to mention how much room do you really have to download 
hundreds and hundreds of songs. You're not going to even listen. Yes, you're not going to even get to them. All right. I was not literally get to just, all that. I was literally just thinking about that because nowadays everyone, all they use is their phones, right? So if they're, you know, if they got their phone, you know how, and their phone has 32 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes. I don't know how many. What was it? 256 now that the new iPhone has, but. Eventually, if if you're a real fan of music, you're going to run out of room and you're not going to be able to um, keep all that music on there. So I understand where, you know, you have the issue there and streaming kind of solves that. But, man, you're you're losing out. The artists are losing out a ton because the structure just isn't fair. Well, let's see what, what it is is now like at some point. Like as an end user, if I hear something. As long as I can point, click, and listen, I don't care if it's on my phone or not, really. But I know that mm-hmm. there, you know, some individuals want to know that, okay, I have this. Well, with cloud technology and virtualization, the whole concept behind that is to keep content in a place so that if you lose your phone, if something happens to your computer or somebody steals your product or your, you know, your phone or computer – um, you still have your content. People do value stuff like that. So the benefit of streaming is going to play right into the blockchain, right? And I, I believe the benefits of downloading is going to still uh, benefit the, us- the end user because of blockchain, it will not allow any double dipping. And I believe the artists will not have to feel like they have to give anything for free unless they unless they choose to do marketing but right now it's a broken model everything's broken on this internet you know and this is what they've been told you know you have to give all this stuff away for free i mean what what other, what other options true. do they have they they don't have much options right now until we get this new model this new 3.0 web 3.0 in place which is being developed as you and i speak and everything changes <laughs> Everything changes. Oh yeah, and it's it's coming and it's gonna come fast. It's that's just, right. It's just I think it's gonna be a matter of educating the musicians and yes, they're gonna have to learn. And the quicker they do that, the quicker things are gonna change for the better. For and I'm them. looking part of I'm looking part of being you know the uh, liaison. Uh, I know a lot of folks and you do too, and. You know, the proof is in the pudding, and sometimes you just have to, you know, um, you got to understand, there's a mindset. A lot of these musicians are like battered women, okay? They've been screwed over so much, man, that they don't believe right away. Sometimes you got, you know, like, you tell them things, and it's almost like it's too good to be true. Right. So, you you know, it's like you got to have, you got to treat them with gloves, okay? Um, <laughs> and, and I you. trust you, you got to like cuddle them, like you know, like like it's an, make sure you don't drop the egg. You know, these guys sometimes they they hear it. You talk to them, but it's like a little bit over their head. So I always try to spoon feed, you know, my friends. It, the, but the moment you tell them things like, you know, you do realize that one day, um, you can actually put your music up and not worry about it being stolen. And you do realize that, you know, one day you won't even need to worry about your copyright. It gets their attention because that means money to them. They, this is what they're struggling with. So I try to spoon feed, you know, folks. And I don't want to I don't try to overwhelm them. I just give them a little bit and they'll come to me and ask me more questions. Vibra vid. vid vibra vid. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, um, beats coin. Right. I mean, you guys, um, what you what you working on it is to me is just like cutting the edge stuff and it caught my attention you know i was i was out there looking i had concepts of my own i shared with you i had concepts about right. tracking music you know but i i was approaching it from a different perspective before i knew about anything about blockchain you know but the, i had the same concept of trying to track the music and give back you know put revenue streams back in the pocket of the artist you know but what you guys are doing is is grand, you know. And I know you're focusing in the beginning on uh, on the music side, but I know you have a bigger and broader picture. And um, I see you guys as being a big player in this, man. Yeah, I, 
the reason why I got into it was specifically the music side, and I, I do see the the large picture, but that's the first thing that I wanted to tackle that they all of us on the team wanted to tackle because that's the one that's that presents the biggest opportunity. And yep. you know, we can build a nice, pretty platform, and I've seen other projects, other websites they have nice websites and everything, but honestly, it's gonna come down to education. And it's going to come down to, you know, getting more believers. And and when I talk about believers, it's specific believers, people influential in the industry or, uh, you know, musicians themselves. Because what's going to happen when, you know, one popular musician realizes, hey, this is a better route for me to go. They're going to tell their other popular musician friend, right? Of course. Of course. And, I mean, just like the Internet, you know, I, I, I saw that whole thing, you know. Is I, I think I told you I'm an engineer, right? I'm a technology yes. engineer. I started out as a technician repairing computers when IBM computers came out. So I've seen this whole thing play out. I've seen this show before. I've seen this movie. And, you know, I know it sounds like, okay, I've heard that before. It's broken. No, it really is. And, we, and just today, we, I just saw it, you know, information being linked out, leaked out again, you know, on Facebook. So what's going to happen here is the entertainers will start talking about this, like, for example, uh, Justin Sun, you know, and I believe that's going to, with Kobe Bryant being a part of some function, you know. I cannot wait for that. I'm so excited. He's going to spread the, exactly, he's going to spread the news. Eventually, this thing is going to start catching on, just like the internet caught on. You know, the way I look at it is everybody had to have a website at some point. Okay. It, first right. of all, before the internet, it was like you got to have a business card. Okay. Well, then when, <laughs> when we got into this thing with the internet, you got to have a dub 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 website. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now, your brand is going to be a token. Everybody's going to have to have their token. That's going to be your brand, right? So, the blockchain is very very disruptive. It's got so many use cases. It's scary. It really is. And. Um, the technical people, like, and I call you technical because you're part of a team that's, you know, you see the work that's going on in the, in the de- on the development side. It's going to take more than us, you know. It's obviously we have to communicate this, but it's just a, it's a, it's a natural evolution. It's a natural evolving of, of, of a technology that's old and the new coming in, and you're going to see things are going to start to move all of a sudden. Something's gonna click, and people are just gonna start jumping on. It could be in high, it could be a kid in high school that gets onto Guild Chat or something, you know, and then you know they play a game, and everybody start talking about this game, or, and they learn about blockchain. You know, it, it's this thing is gonna spark. That's so true. That's so true. You 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 don't know. It's kind of man. I don't I, I don't know where to go from from this because you can take it into so many different directions but yeah it's it's kind of like the the internet in the very beginning eventually it's just going to be widely adopted you know that's whether right people want to be speculative or not yes. i think i i mean i've in over a year almost a year and a half well no really just a year of kind of being in the space and learning so much i would be lying to myself if i just were to be speculative but what's your – tell me your journey in, in crypto. How did you kind of learn about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, or when did you learn about it? Okay. Honestly, I heard about it in 2000 – I want to say it was like 2009. And, I, and that's, that's frightening to me because, I mean, I'm a little pissed at the same time <laughs> because think about 2009, <laughs> right? Right. 2009, I should be telling you about all this money I have and, you know, my uh, and, you know, investments and giving back, you know, um, it was a guy who is a producer. OK. Um, and I hadn't seen him for a while. And we met up just to catch up with each other. And he said, hey, you know, have you heard of Bitcoin? You really need to you need to really start getting into Bitcoin. It's a way where, you know, you can, you can use this to, to buy, to buy things and you don't, you don't have to, and there's no taxes on it. So hence when you, for me, you know, like had this person, 
explain to me more about what Bitcoin was about other than avoiding paying taxes or just underground stuff. It was a turnoff, mm-hmm. right? So I, right, I, right. I kind of heard it and then I kind of moved forward. I mean, you know, I'm, it wasn't enough to kind of captivate you. It, it wasn't. And so I never thought I'm like, I was, I'm, I'm a very busy person. I always keep myself busy. I mean, I have a lot of things that, you know, trying to keep up in my industry. So I, why I don't have time to be trying to figure out what this is and I don't know what it is. I mean, it sounds like some underground stuff. I don't want to, I don't want to get involved, but let's fast forward. <laughs> so, um, another friend of mine was saying, Oh man, you're going to buy Bitcoin. I'm like, um, I don't know. I, and I, I'm not really into it, but in 20, in 20, 2017, it was, it was 2017 fourth quarter. Um, I wanted to know more about what this Bitcoin was. So, you know, I'm a, I'm, like I said, I'm a technical person, but I'm not foolish. You know, I, I'm not going to jump into anything without doing my research. So I, I went to U- Udemy or Udemy or Udemy and I ended up um, taking a course on what is blockchain? What is crypto? Right? What is Bitcoin? And I was learning that, the, you know, the acronyms and what a wallet is, hardware wallet is. I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm feeding myself now. I'm understanding this. Oh yeah, the lights are coming on now. I'm like, wow. Okay, I got to really get into this. So, eventually, one of the instructors mentioned a guy, and gave a shout out to a guy named Ian Bellina. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're giving a shout out to Ian Bellina, let me Google him. So when I Googled Ian Bellina, he at the time had this following. And what Ian Bellina would, would do is that he was also an engineer from IBM. And he, he was into analytics, big data, where you, know, you, you basically look at data and you, you figure out based upon data, you see patterns and you can predict you know, a model, right? So he took his engineering background with big data analytics and he, he started applying it to crypto and he did it with ICOs. So this guy was the man. He he came up with a spreadsheet and a formula for rating ICOs. He called it um um well, he coined the term uh crypto analytics or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point where if you want to get into an ICO uh, on on the Ethereum side, it, because if Ian Bellina rated it as like his top, he had this rating system, most folks would automatically just start running over. It got to a point where you could get into an ICO around, you know, you had three weeks to get into it. It got to a point as soon as, as, soon as Ian Bellina gave it a thumbs up, that thing was like selling out. Wow. So Ian Bellina caught my attention. Um, I was following him and he would break things down. Why you should invest in this ICO. They have, a, you know, their team is solid. Um, Did he introduce Tron to you? <laughs> well, at the time, he, you know what, that's a very, I think, I, I don't know if I got TRX from him or not. Most likely, I probably did. He may have had it up there. But he would, t- I know like he had um, a, lot of, a lot of these uh, altcoins that was doing 50X and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. It was all, it was the year of ICOs. When I met Ian right. Bellina, uh, not personally, he was already at. Gosh, he was something like four hundred. He had like four hundred thousand, but by wow. the end of the year, he was at. He made his first million, and then after that, he took off, and he was like, made a lot, a lot of money, right? And then the whole ICO thing just kind of tanked. But I think I got Tron. May have gotten Tron off of him. I'm not sure to be honest with you. To, to you, be quite honest with you. So um, we know that you you're you're a Tron guy now. What what brought you into Tron? What made you realize it was Holy cow, this is the next big thing. Okay. Very good question. So Ian Bellina was a guy who 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 did nothing but ICOs and all the ICOs were on Ethereum. Okay. So of course, you know, I want to know, well, what what is Ethereum about? What the heck is Ethereum? It's you know, it's a it's it's a it's a topology. It's a protocol that deals with infrastructure. And Ian Bellina would always say, I'm you know, I don't I don't invest in dApps mostly. I'm doing infrastructure. So what caught my attention was, well, um, Vitalik Buterin, um, genius guy, him and Charles Hoskinson, they, they came, they were on the Bitcoin side. And then they, they kind of 
left because they felt that they needed to introduce something called smart contracts and try to make the transactions per second faster than the blockchain that, that Bitcoin operated on. So after trying to understand what some of the shortcomings are with Ethereum, I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be interesting. So everybody's speculating, but, there's, but the technology is not ready yet. So in other words, we got all We're these trying, great... right? You're talking about... I'm, I'm, no, 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 not trying yet. I'm, I'm leading up to Tron. Okay. I'm, on e I'm on Ethereum telling you what caught my attention to Tron because... Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. You, you, had this, you had these cars that were like Ferraris and Lamborghinis, but you had these, you know, you only had one lane. You didn't have, you know, you didn't have the Autobahn yet to drive it on, but people are speculating. So I'm like, oh, wow. You know, and then all of a sudden, here's this young guy, and I'm starting to get these videos, and I'm, you know, great topics. Rick Cooks uh, is trying to scam. Justin Sun's a scam. Uh, don't, buy, don't. I'm like, what is this? What, what is Tron, you know? And then I'm reading on this. The next Internet Web 3.0, we're, we're going to replace, we're going to place the blockchain that Ethereum operates on. We'll, we'll be able to do thousands of transactions per second. So I'm like, hmm, well, the issue right now is speed. I mean, you got all these use cases, but you, you can't go prime time. You can't compete against American Express or MasterCard because they do thousands of transactions per second. Now, here you are, this company, this guy who is not just, this guy is coming from Hupan University, understudy, one of the top students at Hupan University of Jack Ma, you know, CEO of Alibaba. And this guy is saying he's going to change the internet. So now I'm looking at Tron and trying to figure out, okay, well, you're going to create the infrastructure and you're saying you're going to create a new internet called Web 3.0. That's huge. That's huge. And yes, you, you know, you went to GitHub and yes, you, you, you know, you, you copied uh, code from the GitHub, but everybody does that. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. Cause we were talking about that last time and you, um, you gave me an awesome illustration and I said, save that because we will need, <laughs> we'll need you to say that on the podcast because yes. that's exactly what you hear with these people who are haters on Tron. Um, they always go back to the same thing. The, the white paper code, blah, 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 blah. The code's not that great. Right. And what was your, what was your response when you were talking to me? I know you probably might not remember exactly how no, you I, said it. I, <laughs> what I, I said it. I said, you know, there's only seven notes in music. Yes. You, you know, before you go, before oh, you beautiful. go to the octave, you, you start from C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Mm -hmm. There's your seventh, and now you go octave C. And I was telling you that you know you could take a song, and it could be a great song, and then you can have another musician or artist take that same song, and they're influenced by it, but they have a slight different personality, a, a presentation. They just change it around. Everybody's influenced by everybody. There's nothing new in the music that we do. It's just a different expression. You should one day just you know just take away some of the lyrics and just listen to this music. And you'd be like, oh, I've heard that before. Well, yeah, you have, you know, yeah. like playing with modes, you know, somebody may have done it in Dorian. And yes. but they 75, they <laughs> 75 yeah. of the songs I make with guitars, like E minor, yes. C, G and D. <laughs> That's the easiest there's song. nothing, there's no such thing as original, really. It's just that, you know, the truth be told, I don't think yet it's possible unless, the, you know, unless all of a sudden, we start seeing these people, cloned, cloned people coming out with the same handprints. But the point is, there's nothing new and original, okay? We all evolve from some music that's been done before. So I thought it was very clever that Justin Sun looked at what was done before and said, I'm going to make this better, right? I think quite naturally, if you were working on, if, if, if you were, let's say, um, Vitalik Buterin and you, you know, somebody was copying your code, well, you can look at it like, well, it's a compliment or, you know, I'm pissed off because you're, you're taking an idea and uh, you're, you're doing something ground up. Used to be on my platform, by the way. You were ERC-20. Now you're moving off. And by the way, you took it from me. But I, like, I, I don't have a problem at all. Put it this way. What cell phone do you have, Alex? Just curious. What do you talk on? Uh, an iPhone. Okay. So the Apple 
must be the biggest scam out there because guess what? Motorola started this whole thing. <laughs> when I grew up, yeah, man, when I grew up, you know, it was the, it, we called it, if, if you had a cell phone, you were cool. And this thing was a, really a brick, okay? Man, you used okay. to walk around with this brick right, in your hand. Right, right. And I'm sorry to interrupt because I know I'm going to forget this, but it's funny because we some very similar yesterday. Um, I don't know if I saw it on my phone or an advertisement. My, we were watching the, the the football game, and then I noticed that you can FaceTime multiple people now. And I'm like, man, Apple's doing that. And but there's a, there's an, I know there's an app called House Party for that, and there's other apps where you can chat with multiple people on FaceTime. And That's right. What does Apple do? They just wait, see how other people do it, and then they implement it themselves, their way. And a lot of times, it's honestly better. Well, I mean, listen, we don't have to even go back to Motorola. We can look at uh, HTC. They came out with the big, you know, big phone, um, and then Samsung's came out with the big phone um, and knocked HTC out of the box. And then sent, so you have Samsung, you know. So, I mean. That's how things work. You know, to be honest with you, um, China has been known to take a lot of ideas from the U.S. So, but again, coming back to Tron, I don't see anything wrong there. It's just pure, pure creativity. And I think at the end of the day, you're going to have two, just like you have Apple, you have Microsoft, okay, you have IBM, there's different spaces. Like when I got into computers, I saw Apple was on the entertainment side for multi- desktop publishing. You know, I worked at 20th Century Fox Studios when they were doing Toy Store and Whitney Houston was out there. I, I used to repair computers out there. I was a technician at the time. And um, they had Macs all over the place. But if you wanted the business side, you had IBMs. Now, why am I saying that? Because you do realize that there's enough space for Ethereum to have a use case that may the enterprise may take to in a different way where on the entertainment side, Tron is that platform. And that's Whereas, what they claimed. If, if you remember, that's what they were claiming in the beginning. Yes. Yes. You know, and so, you know, it's not going to be about, you know, just Tron or Ethereum. You're going to have all these blockchains because blockchain itself is the technology that creates efficiency, accuracies, okay? It's going to get rid of a lot of overhead for a lot of good reasons that even enterprise, you know, they can't wait to get there. They're, they're doing half and a half, <laughs> all right? They're doing like um, Hyperledger, which is mm-hmm. part blockchain, part centralization. They can't just drop their business into a blockchain. You know, they have to evolve and migrate there. But the point is, um, I think that I'm, in the end, those two guys will probably end up being like Steve Jobs and, you know, and Bill Gates. And I mean, the same thing, man, you know, these guys were copied from each cool. other too. I think they, I think they, I think they will. You, you, you have, to me, this, uh, Justin Sun is like, he's got a, a combination of sales, marketing and engineering where Vitalik, you know, he's like the back office guy, you know, he, his, his, his whole thing is more. Yeah, that's, that's a very good a, illustration. People hate on Justin just because he's a good salesman and a good marketer. Yeah, he's a he's a business guy. He went to that's yeah. I, I mean like you know to he call can't, him Schiller. Exactly, man. He's got a both. He's got both sides of it. And then, you know, so he's like he's able to kind of like step out and and if you think about this, most most um most startup companies, they have to go out and hire this marketing team, you know, sales team. Why? Because that's what Microsoft did. They basically Microsoft wasn't the best company when I got in. When I got in, it was Novell. Nobody knew about Novell because they didn't know how to market. But Microsoft, Bill Gates, what he did is he went up high in the sky and took all of his software and dropped it out and said, "It's free. It's free. Take it. It's free candy." You know. And then mm-hmm. everybody kind of got hooked on it. And then he says, "Oh, by the way, now there's a small fee you have to pay if you like my software." By that time, it was already in the office, but it wasn't the best software out there. It's just that. He knew how to market. So sometimes it's not the best technology, you know what I mean? But I believe that Tron is – this guy has been all about his business. When I, when I started following him, I started seeing the haters, and I'm like, you know what? There's a reason why those people are hating, you know? <laughs> Maybe they're just they, – they invested too much in Ethereum. They don't want to – you know, they don't want to sit 
go anywhere. I mean, they don't want to lose their money, but uh, at the end of the day, man, this guy is always delivering on time, too. You notice yeah. that? When he says mm-hmm. it's going to be a release, it's there. Now, yeah, sometimes things get hyped up, but again, he's got a, he's a sales guy and he's an engineer. Yeah. And, and he's an the, innovator. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, like you said, they've, they've delivered on everything, and the community is there to back it up. Look how many transactions are happening. Look how everything's working out. Yep. I have no doubt that within a matter of time, you know, Tron is going to be, and, and I'm not talking about price here. I'm just talking about in popularity and use, it's easily going to grow twice as big, four times as big, 10 times as big, 20 times as big. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and sooner rather than later because of the marketing that they do. And no, I mean, no, I, I agree. And and we haven't even talked. Uh, we haven't even mentioned BitTorrent. That's that right there is going to make. Well, it. oh my goodness! I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, it's like when Napster. See, and that's the interesting thing, right? It t- tells you how powerful decentralization is, because how did Napster get knocked? Here's a company that, that disrupted the whole ecosystem for the entertainment business, made it very hard for artists to to make a living. Right, the music is being downloaded for free. Why should I buy your music? Record labels are kind of like struggling now. They're not getting paid. So how the heck did Napster disappear? Because they're a central entity. That means that they can be manipulated, bullied, and controlled. Somebody can walk into your office and give you, you know, an option. <laughs> you know, you take it or leave it. And and they took it. They took the option. You know. And so when you look at BitTorrent, well, there's no central entity. It was. All these computers spread out, and each computer had a piece of information that represented a complete song. So if you wanted something, some kind of content, it didn't come from one computer. It was like bits and pieces kind of like you know, coming together to make one, one song. You know? And mm-hmm. to have that still exist today, that infrastructure is all over the place. It's big. It's, the internet is all about BitTorrent, to have Tron absorb that, to take that over, tells you the mindset of a Justin Sun. This guy knows what he's doing, man. I'm telling you, he reminds me of a young Stephen Jobs, Bill Gates, those kind of guys, right? He knows what he's doing. And anything good takes time. The internet didn't, didn't just take off overnight. It really didn't. When I got involved, it was no internet. It was something called bulletin boards. It was a green screen. It, no, really, it was a green screen. You know, like when you go into Pet Boys, you ever been like to car stop? You see this green screen, and you know it's got numbers and menus. Yeah, you had to, and you had you had to connect your phone, and you made these weird noise on modems. There was no, there was no, there was really no internet at the time. You know, it was still a development, and then it went from that, and then you had Earthlink putting out newspaper clips. You know, Earthlink, we're gonna have the email service, and then they got bought out. You know. Yep. The point is, I saw this whole thing, man, play out with the internet. And it wasn't intended to be like it is now. It was supposed to be, if you can get access to a phone line, you can get to the internet, you have fair access, you can, you can have the same access to information that anybody else can have. That is not what we have living today. It is being censored. We all hear, we know the stories. Our information is being taken away from us. You know, we have no control over our data. The whole role changes, and Justin Sun is playing a big part of this, and, and so is a lot of other companies, by the way. Because, again, there's use cases A through Z. We happen to be talking about the music side of it because we're, we're musicians, you know. Right. And we're going to benefit from a, a blockchain like Yep. Listeners, listeners, listen to Brian <laughs> because <laughs> he's got words of wisdom right there. I know I know your last name is pronounced Genois, but we should we should really pronounce it how it's spelled, genius. <laughs> well, I tell you I'm going to tell you something. Here's a little secret. In high school, everyone called me genius. That was my last name. And it, 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 it the English side is it's genius. But I I used to like shy away from that. It was a lot of pressure. Nowhere close to <laughs> that. And so too. And I, but I had a, I had straight A's, man. I got into UCLA. You know, that name made me work hard. Put it that way. I had to work hard for everything. All right. I didn't have it. <laughs> some guys didn't have, didn't have to study. They, they got A's. I had to study to get to get my good grades. But someone said, "Oh, hi, Genoa. How are you doing?" I'm like, 
well, what is the origin of this name? It's got a French pronunciation to it. And so to take the edge off, <laughs> I like the Genoise. It's very suave, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> but the very name, I give a lot of credit. It kept me on point. That's cool, man. <laughs> That's really cool. So uh, I, want, I want to say thank you for making that little production for us that uh, I'm playing on the intro and outro. Um, you still do music. You're still involved in music. You um, were telling me you have a like your home digital audio workstation, and yes, you can create. You, I, I mean, as as you can hear from the intro and outro, it's some pretty good stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, picking back up the pieces. You know, I've I've gone through phases. I mean, you know, trying to hold the nine to five, and um, but. Uh, I broke down my studio about, God, time flies. I want to say about my, my home studio. I may have had a DAW, but I broke it down about six or seven years ago, and I reduced it to a laptop and um, started focusing more on my guitar and, and getting into theory because I play mainly by ear. And things are coming full circle, man. And just just this week, I ordered um, the, 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 the rival to the MPC. You know, MPC is a drum machine that, Dr. Dre and everybody out of the 80s and 90s sampled with, okay? And then Native Instruments came out with something, their version of it, that's a software version of it. Um, and so, you know, I, I picked that up. It's my second version of it. Um, and I hadn't had one for a while. So um, pretty soon you'll start hearing. Excited to play with it. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, what you the intro and outro that you have, that, that was like seven years ago, you know? So I, now I'm getting ready to do new stuff, man. You know, That's you'll cool, hear man. more guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. When, you know, when artists ask me, do you know a guitar player that can do a track for us? You know where I'm going to send them to. There you go. Hey, man. Well, I really enjoyed uh, having this conversation. It went it went kind of long, actually, but uh, that's because it was that good. Uh, I wow. want to end with I want to end with a random question. I saw this on ESPN the other day. What what do you prefer, waffles or pancakes? Um, I will say waffles. Um, I'll tell you why. Because growing up in Los Angeles, there's a place called Roscoe's Waffles and Chicken. And <laughs> everybody, it's anybody would go there, right? Chicken and waffles. So waffles. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm saying waffles, but I still haven't. Like if we were going to debate about this with someone else that likes pancakes, I still don't. I wouldn't have my presentation ready for waffles, but. Yeah, I just wanted to throw that one in there for some fun. Yeah, well. All right, brother. I'm hey, well, I appreciate <laughs> Hey, me too. <laughs> I appreciate you so much for for coming on and taking some time this evening, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you. And um, if the people want to uh, reach out and have a conversation with you, I know you're on Telegram, uh, and you have Twitter too. What's your Twitter handle? Well, <laughs> I shouldn't know that because I change it up. I'm not consistent. I you know what? Say it, I'll, yes. I'll tag it on the, uh, on, the, on the little notes for the podcast. <laughs> it could be at Crypto Takeout, but you know what? That, that, I think that's – I had that for Telegram, at Crypto Takeout. I think I created something like that. But honestly, uh, you, better, you better look it up. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll link it in the description. All right, man. Well, thank I want to you thank so you. Much. I want to thank you as well. You know, really, it's been a, a great experience, Alex. Thank you. I'm humbled to you know to be on your podcast. Hey, man. Likewise, in with you, man. It's uh, it's been great. You know, we're what over ten episodes in and getting the chance to talk to all different sorts of people, and you know, everyone has something to learn from everyone, right? Yes, absolutely. So, let's end it there, buddy. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Genius on the track. Imagine waking up in a day. You don't really know what to say. When the sparks come and hit you like lightning, you just go on your way. There's something like a feeling you get when you lose control. Cause I've had my share of dreams and I just wanna let go We can party till the clock don't stop And I can't let this feeling slip away Don't let it slip away When you feel like you got it on lock Cause when you turn around and take it to the top Don't slip away 
don't let it slip away. Thank you for listening to episode number 10. We have many great interviews lined up for the coming weeks going into the next year of 2019. So make sure if you aren't already, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening to so you could stay up to date to the minute. Also, follow us on Twitter at BeatsCoin. And if you want to follow me, I am at ProGera. If you want to email me any music you have, it is agera at viverbid.io, and we'll feature that on our listening series. Anyways, have a great day, night, afternoon, whatever time it is. Until next time, peace.